and we're going to spend the next hour just really diving deeply uh, into everything to do with localized content. Uh, but Carrie, if you were sort to give us a, a little introduction to yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Carrie Hill. I'm a local search analyst for Sterling Sky out of Canada, and I'm also the event planner and community manager for local university. I got started in search and marketing in 2006 um, as a worker drone that did directory submissions endlessly for hours and hours and hours a day. And after about six months of that, I told my boss, you have to give me something else to do or I'm going to go postal. Like it was bad. <laughs> I hated it. And that sort of started me down the path towards, um, I work with Mary Bowling, who I'm sure a lot of you know, and um, she kind of took me under her wing and was my mentor and taught me SEO and taught me, you know, about local and content. And we were business partners for a while in a company called Igniter Digital. And then I had the opportunity to kind of go with local you when Joy bought it last year. So I went with local you and now I'm with Sterling Sky. Um, I've spoken about search and local search and technical SEO all over Canada and the United States, all the conference circuit stuff. So um, like I said, this is my favorite format for for interacting with people and sharing what I know and, and um, you know, the collegial atmosphere of these kind of things. I just love it. So, you know, get your questions in. I'm happy to help as much as I can, or at least try and point you in the right direction to some answers. I don't don't know everything. <laughs> I don't believe that at all. We'll, uh, but we will, we'll, 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 we'll try and challenge you today for sure. What, um, what, is your, what, is it, what do you do as an analyst, as a local search analyst? It's a very, um, oh. it's a very, it's a very good, grand, detailed title. So here's a funny story. Joy doesn't really care what we call ourselves. So it was sort of like a communal, what should we be title thing. Um, I do everything. Um, I'm heavily into on-page local SEO. In my current role, we have a publicist and an out outreach specialist that do links. So I'm not too much on that side of things. But really what we do is pick apart problems and figure out how to solve them. Because every local search business, because their niche and their market are different, is a different animal. You can't really make like this box of cookie cutters that say you do this and then you do this and then you do this and then you have brain. That's not how it works. Because there's so much variance in markets, in competitors, in the niche that you're in, or are you even, you know, putting yourself in the right niche? If we, if we really want to get down to the nitty gritty of it, a lot of the clients that come to us don't even have the right um, category <laughs> in their Google My Business listing. So I think it's really kind of the analyst part is finding the problems and then coming up with strategies to solve them for our clients on a client by client basis. Okay, when you think about content for your clients. Um, you know, what's the kind of breadth of that and that you sort of focus on? Because, you know, let's say we've got on the site, then you've got kind of content in other areas. Um, sure. You know, how, do you, how do you approach the, the, the challenge of content? Right. So I think that the, you kind of have to take a step back when you, especially when um, we onboard a new client and go, OK, do you have anybody there that can write? Because honestly, it's not a skill that everybody has. And people who don't like to write, you shouldn't force to write. And so if they don't have anybody that that can write, then that kind of changes our strategy because content's so important. And maybe they have a lot of content on their website, but it's not structured correctly. It's not optimized right. It's not um, focused on the right topics or the right geographic areas, which is huge. Like putting what you do and where you do it on your website, that's probably the number one problem we run into, to be perfectly honest. And um, so my approach to content is if you don't have somebody who can write, I can write for you and here are some strategies to kind of help us be successful at this. And um, you can't really write in a vacuum. The client has to be involved in some way, shape or form. I like to do interviews. I like to send them a list of questions that they can ask or they can answer for me. That doesn't necessarily turn into an FAQ. It might just be some like I need these questions answered so I can create this content because I don't know what you do or where you do it or how you do it. So, um, 
you know, I think that there's different strategies to kind of get people writing, but I really think talking to the people with their boots on the ground is important. And that might be the technicians. It might be the customer service people that answer the phone all the time and they know what people are asking for, or what the problem is. Sometimes talking to the person in the C-suite or the marketing department is not the right person to be talking to when you talk about content. Okay, wow. I've got a thousand directions I could go with my next question. Sure. I'll, uh, I don't, I'll uh, drop it down. So, obviously, you had the challenge in the first place of identifying who's going to create the content. Mm -hmm. you know, and you said you don't want to push people if they're not comfortable writing because the end result may not be kind of what, what, you, what mm -hmm. you want. And you, you know. But do you, is, is your preference to get the clients to write? Um, or do you think, actually, you know what, we know what we're doing. You know, we are, we know what we're trying to achieve and we can learn the topic with, with their help. And what do you think ends sure. up being the best long-term situation? So for me, the best long-term situation is if the client can write their own content. Um, and I can polish that. Like I can optimize it. If you could just get the gist of what you do and how you do it and what your EVP, your extra value proposition is down on paper, I can polish it and turn it into really good web content. You know, I can structure, I can get the bullet points in, I can make it readable, I can add the calls to action. If you can create the content as the client and get that to me, that's our best case scenario. That probably happens 10% or less of the time. Um, a lot of our clients are busy running their businesses. They're busy being plumbers. They're busy being lawyers. They don't have time to write content. And so the next best thing is for them to at least give us feedback or give me five to 10 bullet points on this topic. And so you don't even have to write complete sentences. Just give me your thoughts, you know, do a brain dump for me. Um, that's the next best scenario. The third best scenario for me is like a phone interview where I can just ask them a few questions. That rarely happens as well because time is valuable. If I send them an email with some questions in it, they can answer them and get it back to me at midnight or whenever they're They've got a little bit of time that they can pull out of their schedule. So that's kind of like the three approaches to it. My best case scenario is if they can write, at least get the stuff down on paper for me and I can turn it into web content. But um, that, like I said, that's pretty rare that you're going to get somebody with that kind of buy-in to the process. Okay. If we, um, if we try to take a step back, let's say you're working with, uh, with, a, with a new client and um, you're coming to look at their kind of content sort of strategy. Um, what is it you're trying to achieve with content? Like what's your kind of, you know, how would you go, okay, we'll know if we are successful if we do these things or, or achieve this. Mm -hmm. you know, what's, your, what's your kind of beginning point and where do you know where you're trying to get to? So my ultimate point is um, sales or lead gen. That's my ultimate goal with a piece of content. And so when we start down this path, what we're really looking for is the topics that we need to cover that their market is looking for. So we can mesh the lookers and the bookers with the content on the website and create something that converts. And so um, I think just writing content to have content, that's not just volume is not the goal here. Um, you know, content that ranks well, that um, is optimized for conversion, not just SEO. I mean, I could write, you know, 2000 words and get it to rank. But if somebody landed on the page, it would look like garbage. And they're, they'd never, I mean, if I haven't added my calls to action and made sure that I'm leading them on a path into my conversion funnel, I'm not doing it right. So, um, you know, the ultimate goal is that conversion, right? Whatever that may be, whether it's lead capture, whether it's an on-page purchase or an on-site purchase, whatever that happens to be. But um, I think that um, getting them into that sales funnel is super important. And so that's really my ultimate goal with writing content. So then you have to take a step back and decide what am I going to write about? What, where do we need to fill these gaps? And that's where you're on your onboarding process. Um, a lot of times we have clients come on board who give have services or products that aren't even on their website. So in onboarding, you kind of have to step back and say, okay, what's not on your website that you do? What What's missing? Um, what local areas are you looking to rank better in or pull business from? Um, you know, what are the geos that you're not targeting right now or doing poorly with? Um, so um, I think that, you know, kind of marrying that I need, I need to 
write content that converts and I need to write content for audiences that are actually going to convert, like that's the hot spot, right? That's the, what they call it, a Venn diagram where the circle goes and then where it meets in the middle. You know, that's, that's what we're looking for, converting content that's focused on the people who actually want to buy from our clients. Okay, and how do you how do you know what is in that <clears throat> that kind of overlap piece there? How do you and how do you focus on that and ignore mm -hmm. well, a whole range of other stuff so that you really are getting sure. the maximum value for the effort you're putting in? So sometimes the clients know, or they can at least lead us down that path. They're like, you know, I really need to get more. If it's a lawyer, let's say they're like, I really need to get more mass tort business. I'm not getting enough in my area, and that's where my bread and butter is. Um, then that that tells me, okay, we need to look into what you have on your website already that's around mass tour, what's missing, who's your competitor in the area. I'm a really big fan of content gap analysis. Um, Ahrefs has a pretty good one where you look at what keywords your competitors that are really killing the market are ranking for that you're not ranking for. And, um, you know, does any of that fall into the where they want to do business kind of um bucket. And that, so we'll kind of go down that path with them. If the client knows, sometimes the client's like, I don't know what to do. I don't know. You know, they can't answer those questions for us. And then we kind of use a little bit of experience. So we know that any kind of, for a lawyer, I'm going to use a lawyer. We have a lot of lawyer clients. I'm going to use them as an example. We know that any kind of um, personal injury case that gets an insurance company involved can be very lucrative for a personal injury lawyer. And so we're looking at dog bite cases and car accident, and truck accident, and bicycle accident, and motorcycle accident. And do you do all of these things first? And if they say, yes, yes, I do that. Then we look for content on the website that matches that. If they have it, great, we'll fix it up. If they don't have it, then that goes on our um, content calendar, that goes on our editorial calendar so that we can get that content written, whatever that looks like, whether they provide it or we write it. Um, so there's a lot of analysis involved at the beginning of what are you missing, what do you need, and how do we create it? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> With your content calendar, just kind of, is the, do, you think of, do you think of something as content, uh, the content kind of something that you'll, you'll, you'll do week in, week out, month in, month out for the entire duration of a relationship with the customer? Or do you expect that actually, once you've got a certain amount of content that covers off the core things that they do, actually the, the kind of incremental effort and time spent there is maybe spent on other aspects? Or do you see it as, as a constant I, ongoing? I don't see it as an ongoing. We will write for every month into in perpetuity. No, because that's how crappy content gets created because I have to provide four pages of content. I don't know what to write about. We've already covered all your bases, so I'm going to put out garbage. I don't like that tactic at all. I think that what we need to do more is look at, okay, once we've got all our bases covered, then we go back and say, how can I optimize this to convert better? Is it ranking well? What could I do to make this better? Do I have all my internal links set the way they that they need to be? Do I need to get the earned media team on maybe some thematic links that are, you know, topic specific versus just, you know, niche specific kind of thing. And, you know, then we try and improve the rankings and improve the conversion rate. Because honestly, until your conversion rate's 100%, which I've never seen and never happens, um, you know, you're not done optimizing that page or optimizing that conversion funnel. Do you have a kind of target goal for conversion? Or do you know when you've reached a, uh, a, a decent level of conversion, at which point, you know, actually more work put in there is unlikely to yield too much extra? I think um, it's rare, um, but when you see your conversions kind of plateau and you really honestly can't think of anything else to do and your A-B testing is not revealing any increases, then I think, you know, you're probably good to move on. Um, you know, if you're ranking one and two, you've got, you know, this all the featured snippets you could possibly get if you want them. Some people don't, some people do. Um, if you're, you know, seeing conversions kind of plateau and you keep, you know, throwing stuff at the wall and nothing's sticking, nothing's bumping that number up again. Um, I think you may have, you might have maxed the market or the or, or the opportunity there. I don't know. Uh, um, it's kind of a, I've not seen it really happen very much. I think that when you add the opportunity of things we can do 
the things we can do plus budget plus how long, you know, the average lifespan of a client, it's really hard to get to that point. Right. Okay. Given all the different types of content that you could create for um, a local business, maybe you could kind of talk through which ones you think are, you have a hierarchy of them. Um, mm -hmm. And you know what, you know how you might define that hierarchy. If it's you know around the ones that are always going to yield the most conversions or the most sort of visibility, um, and any types of content that you think, you know what, actually that's just sometimes people put a lot of effort into it, but it doesn't really deliver. You know, what's, what, what is the sort of sweet spot in the kind of types of content you create? So um, this it kind of depends upon the market and the niche because you really have to analyze like what's working in that market for that category. But um, in general, I like um, medium length content, not too short, not too long. Um, it has to have bullet points. It has to have a testimonial in it. It has to be focused on some geographic area, even if it's your homepage. Your homepage should be your bullseye geographic area optimized for your bullseye. Like, where are you? You know, you should have some kind of geographic focus on that page. Um, I think that, um, you know, getting those calls to action in the page, you know, FAQs on every page, I think are important right now. Um, the markup opportunities and the amount of real estate you take up in the SERP. And we're seeing FAQ show up for homepage. Um, the expanded um, snippet show up for home pages now. So I think that, you know, getting that FAQ on every page and getting it marked up is important. We're seeing really interesting things coming through with how to on mobile and desktop. So I think that there's some opportunity there, depending upon, you know, what the piece of content, you know, how to hire a personal injury lawyer or those types of things could could lead to some interesting snippets that we should definitely be looking at and testing. Um, I don't like paragraph, paragraph, paragraph content, like five paragraph essay content is not my favorite. I don't think it's good for users. People don't read on the internet. I think things with bold headers and bullet points. And um, I like if I'm doing a set of bullet points, I really like um, bolding like the main points within that bullet. So if it's like a bullet and it's a couple sentences, like bolding, like what do I need to know in this section of content? I think that's really great for users to draw the eye. Um, I think um, paying very close attention to where the fold is in your content based on you know resolution, screen size, whatever, and making sure that you've got your um, exact or extra value proposition in your calls to action above the fold, whatever that happens to be. Um, I am not a fan of the slider images that take up the whole top of the page and you have to scroll to get to text. Not my favorite way to deliver content. So I think that there's um, there's different ways that you can um, structure your content to entice a reader to get them into your funnel. But really, honestly, the most important part for UX is above the fold. And the most important part for SEO is probably below the fold. I mean, if we're going to be honest about it, that's kind of how it works. <laughs> okay, so to, to interpret that, I guess, you know, above the fold is your opportunity to impress and convert the user. Uh, below the fold, users don't like to scroll too much, but you can add extra kind of content to Kind of localize, contextualize, and make relevant the the page that uh, that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay. When you mentioned FAQs, by the way, and having those mm -hmm. new pages, are you assuming that it's different FAQs per page rather than yes. repeating F repeating FAQs? You can't repeat FAQs. Google will Google has come out and said, "Don't do that." Um, so, but you only need like four or five to mark up. So if you have 10 FAQs, you could split them between a couple content pages if it's relevant to each page and split them up. But don't repeat them page to page to page to page. That's How do you do that? When you're working with a multi-location <laughs> client, even they've got mm -hmm. like five or six locations and obviously mm -hmm. the services are very consistent across. How do you manage the FAQ in, in that scenario where you've got, let's say, five location pages or location mm -hmm. hubs? You know, do you, mm -hmm. you can't really... I guess, rewrite where everything is FAQ. So how do you manage that scenario? So if you have multiple locations, a lot of the questions that people are asking themselves are about how do I get to you? Where do I park? Um, when, you know, when are you open? And you can put those types of questions on the specific location pages um, to, to kind of 
add that FAQ element, get that extra real estate, but have it be very location specific. So on each location page, make your FAQ instead of being about the product or service too in depth, make it more about that specific location, but you still have something to mark up there. Okay, okay, gotcha. Um, and also I guess on that sort of point where you've got, um, again, multiple locations in a business, uh, they've got multiple locations and they've probably got multiple services that they provide at those locations. You know, what's your kind of go-to site content structure um, so that you're you know, making sure that you, you localize the service mm -hmm. as much as you can do without kind of stretching it into kind of duplicate content territory? Right. So um, if you're serving multiple geographic markets on the same website, I think you really have to decide First of all, what's your hierarchy of importance? Where's the bullseye? Where do you want to target first? What's the most lucrative neighborhood or nearby city? And that's where you go next. And you kind of make an hierarchy of importance in geographic targets. Then you decide what kind of business you're going to get from that geographic target. And so I usually make a chart, actually, what that's like, OK, here's all the topics I want to target. Here's all the geographic locations I want to target. And then I use those two different entities to build keyword, a, a list of keywords and kind of look at what gets the most searches out of that list. What, you know, what's going to be the most um, volume heavy content, you know, targets out of that list. Then I, I'm a fan of the hub and spoke because I believe you need to have like, a, okay, here's a location hub. And for this location, Denver, Colorado, here's all the services that we provide in Denver. And for this location, Aurora, which is a suburb of Denver, these are all the services we provide for Aurora. And you have to be very careful not to duplicate, you know, write duplicate content. So you write what's unique about those locations or like what are your boundaries within those locations? Will you go anywhere in Aurora? Aurora is huge. So do you, you know, go to the far side, which is, you know, could be an hour and a half drive away from your hub in Denver, like your, your you know, location in Denver, you go all the way. Can you use content to draw those visual boundaries for people? Like this is what our, well, you know, we service to south of the zoo, east of the, you know, college or whatever those boundaries happen to be. That's how you start developing your content there. I also think it's really important to talk to the people who service those locations or who operate the brick and mortars in those locations and ask them, you know, what, what, what draws people to you? Or do they come into your restaurant because they've been at um, the zoo? Because they've been to a sporting event, and this is a really easy place to stop for them. Like, what what's the value proposition of those specific locations, and work that into your content as well. Um, if it's like a lawyer where it's services or something like that, then you kind of have to um, pull in information about where do you go to court in these locations, and how do I get there, and where should I park, and if if we're going to meet for a trial, where should I meet you, and those pieces of content that kind of really localize it down. I think that you can write localized content for multiple topics. Like you can have a Denver personal injury, Aurora personal injury, Thornton personal injury page on your website. You just have to, you know, you can't daisy wheel content. You can't just, you know, find and replace the city names and expect it to work. You have to put effort into it. There's no magic bullet. There's no wand I can wave to be like, oh, you rank here. Oh, you rank there. That's not how any of this works. And anybody that tells you that there's some scheme you can do, like geotagging your photos, it doesn't work. That's not how it works. So uh, <clears throat> with that in nature of trying to localize content, do you think, I mean, when, when does it go too far? I'll give you an example. I was looking, mm -hmm. at, some, I was looking at a website earlier for, <clears throat> for plumbers. Uh, and on the, on the page for a particular kind of location, uh, mm -hmm. it was just randomly mentioning uh, some schools in the area uh, and some mm -hmm. restaurants just mm -hmm. in the middle of the sort of stream. On a plumber, plumber in, the stream, in, the, in the stream of text. <laughs> and, I, and I got what they were trying to do, but I thought like, oh, that is just completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So, you know, where do you kind of, you know, how... How do you, how could you cleverly localize pages uh, and ensure that it remains relevant so you're not damaging conversions? 
So I think this is where you find um, you need a writer versus somebody who can put words on a page. You have to think about what the person shopping in that location, whether it's for a service or a product, is looking for. And so they would want to know, um, you know, the water is particularly terrible in Aurora or the water's very hard and this is why in um Thornton, and this is why we recommend you have a, a water softener. And, you know, here's what we know about um, how the systems work in your area or what we recommend for your area because, you know, water treatment or water opportunities vary from municipality to municipality. So, you know, that's where you, you need to make sure that your content is focused on what the shopper is looking for in that location. Like if I'm writing a page about hot water heaters in my town, so we have terrible water here. We replace our hot water heater every two years because it, it, wow. it it's junk. Um, and that, so I would make sure that, you know, people are seeing that hot water heater replacements, a big deal here. Here are the things you can do to mitigate it or to make it last longer because our water is so hard and, you know, work in facts about that specific municipality. Um, you know, that's kind of the, the difference between, um, a content creator and a writer, right? I can, create content all day long, just throw words on a page, but wordsmithing and, you know, making sure that it's cohesive and a reader wants to read it is so important. Willis Duvall, who used to work for Google, um, I think he works for Gusto now. Um, he, he and I talked about content one time at local university in Austin. And I was like, so here's what I, my gauge is, um, read it to me out loud. And he absolutely agreed. He says, yeah, I have my clients read what they write to me out loud all the time. And if it makes sense when you read it out loud, then that's a really good gauge of, hey, I wrote some pretty decent content right here. If it's garbage and you're bird walking and you're going off topic and it doesn't make any sense when you're reading it out loud, that's when you have to go back to the drawing board. Okay. Okay. I've got little questions. So I'm going to jump to the okay. <clears throat> question section now. Uh, I'm going to pick them up the top. So <clears throat> this question is coming from Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. You had six upvotes. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts and advice on how to handle localized content for a franchise business model uh, that has a national presence. I, it's, it's run by Corp HQ, but each location has a hyper-local target market. Mm -hmm. So this is a, the case where I would talk to the people with the boots on the ground in the area. Um, when I read this question, the first thing that came to my mind was like a Domino's or a Subway kind of thing, like a restaurant franchise or something like that. So um, who comes into your storefront? Who buys from you? Why do they buy from you? What's the value proposition of that location? Is it near everything? Is it have great parking? What are the things that you love? Who are the people that work there? Whose faces are they going to see when they walk in the door? You know, what's the manager's, um, get a quote for the manager of that branch or that location. Um, you know, get some testimonials from people who use that branch or that location and get them on the page. What's the value of picking this locate this brand in this location over the competitors? That's how I'd localize that content in a franchise model. And it's harder because you have to get the people on the ground there involved a little bit. But um, in those cases, what I've done in the past is just called and said, hey, I'm going to ask you five questions. I'm going to record it so that I, ha I can listen to it later as I write the content for your pages. And that's how I kind of approach that model. <clears throat> and to try and I'll drop trumpet uh, words in Stephanie's mouth, but a follow on question. Given probably the brands you mentioned are very sensitive around their brand and kind of corporate HQ, you know, really wants to kind of control the messaging that's going out. Um, you know, how do you how do you how do you able to really localize content so that it's genuinely local and connected mm -hmm. to the community while also getting approval at a brand corporate level? Um, do you tend to find that you kind of get a sort of a set of kind of content options given at a corporate level mm -hmm. that you can then wordsmith to, to work locally? Um, you know, is that something you've come across in, in any of the classes you've worked with? <laughs> I've not dealt with that too much. I've done a little bit of enterprise, but not a ton. Um, in the in the cases that I've worked in it, um, 
they've been very willing to put content, very lo lo very localized focused content on their pages for the individual locations where they would say, you know, Lena is the manager of this location. She's lived in the community since birth, um, you know, for the last 30 years. Um, she likes taking care of her community or, you know, whatever that happens to be. I've not had much pushback from corporate on in those cases. I'm not sure how you would get around that. I think that part of what what my frustration with enterprise is and their brand standards or whatever they want to call it is that they want to rank locally, but they don't want to do the work that it's going to take to do to actually rank locally, like putting that localized content on the page because they're so worried that their brand is not being represented correctly or whatever that happens to be. And so you really have to push them to meet you somewhere in the middle where you're like, okay, if you want to rank for it locally, we're going to have to put local content on the page. You can't put Subway on this page 60,000 times and, and hope to rank in a city where you're not located, like if they want to rank for an adjacent city or something like that. That's not how this works. And so, um, I, like I said, I don't have a ton of experience with that kind of enterprise level thing, but, you know, the more specific content um, you can get for that specific location that you want to rank for on those franchise branch pages, the better off you're going to be. Okay. A similar kind of question that's come to me from, uh, from kind of Gavin. Um, this one is, is different and it's kind of more, it's more kind of, it feels like it's more SMB focused um, rather than um, kind of you know, multi-location or franchises. Mm -hmm. what's, the best, what's the best way to create localized content for a company that's located in a smaller suburb uh, let's say mm -hmm. an, uh, uh, an auto repair shop, maybe it's located in Pineville, uh, North Carolina, but it wants to get business from Charlotte, North Carolina, which is a much bigger, you know, kind of conurbation, mm -hmm. a lot bigger sort of population, but it's a kind of long way away. Um, right. You know, and, obviously, and obviously, maybe to talk about your the, the way you might approach a client needs in that sense sure um, which is very common view. it's very common mm -hmm. we run into this a lot because in local search in the map pack you're probably not going to rank for queries that are not your brick and mortar city it's very hard to rank in the map pack for those locations unless there's very low competition and it's rural um you know in the case of you know pineville and and Charlotte, probably not that case. Charlotte's probably fairly competitive. So SEO content is your best bet in this case. So ranking well organically and getting as high up as you possibly can because you're gonna have to deal with ads and you're gonna have to deal with a map pack of actual people who are in Charlotte. And then you're gonna have to hopefully be towards the top. So that's where you start creating that hub and spoke um, kind of situation. Um, where you start writing content about why should people drive from Charlotte to Pineville to see you? What's your value in them not seeking that help in their town, but but driving to get there? So I think that um, I think there's you know that piece of it. You've got to create the content on your website if you're not in that physical location. If that's not your physical city, you've got to have content on your website about it. And probably more than one page. That's, you know, again, the hub and spoke. So if you're in Charlotte, or maybe it's South Charlotte, I don't know. Um, but let's just use that. If you're in South Charlotte, and you're looking for a reputable five star auto repair facility, we're in Pineville, we're your neighbors, we're happy to we have a shuttle that will take you back home after you drop your car off, or we'll give you a rental car um, that that you can use after you drop your car. So you're not stranded out here in the sticks, which some people might think it is, um, you know, when you when you drop your car mm -hmm. off. And a lot of a lot of those opportunities to offer better service. That's your value proposition. And you've got to work that into your into your content. Um, to make it so that users say, okay, yeah, it's 15 miles away as opposed to this other guy that's five miles away, but he's going to drive me home or he's going to give me a loaner car. And um, he's got all these great ratings and reviews. He's highly recommended. You know, the people in my Facebook group say he's great. You know, those types of content, even offsite, right? So you want people to be your raving fans and talk about you. That's how um, far I'd start. Okay. 
it's, 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 it's always going to be an uphill challenge, particularly for uh, a kind of brick and mortar type business where they've mm-hmm. got to have much more kind of genuinely good competitors locally to the searcher in that scenario. And links, 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 links. You are not going to compete in a semi competitive environment if you are not focused on getting links to your website, whether it's sponsorships locally, your chamber of commerce, your, um, your, you know, local news, maybe you volunteer at the animal shelter, you know, getting those passion projects and, you know, connected to your business and getting those good community links um, are, are really important to making localized content work for you. Okay, so let's talk about the topic of links. And um, mm-hmm. specifically around, you know, using content to create links, different to getting sponsorships or, you know, leaning upon your local associations. Mm-hmm. What, is your, what is your take on the opportunity of generating links when you're writing content for a, for a local business that, let's say, is maybe not as big as an authority mm-hmm. or has got a similar level of authority in a topic as a whole bunch of other professionals sure. who provide, provide that service? So I'm not a big fan of using content to generate links in general because it feels like guest posting and where am I going to, who's going to put it up for me? And if I don't like that cold outreach thing, but um, there are opportunities to create content and partnerships within your community that can really help. Um, I like it when businesses partner. So let's say that you're the auto repair place just outside of um, Charlotte and right next door, there's a little coffee shop and you guys partner together so that what maybe you don't have a waiting room at your at your auto shop. But um, if they pick up a little card when they drop their car off and go over to the coffee shop next door, they get 10 percent off their whatever their order or their orders or however long they have to wait. Free Wi-Fi, you know, all the opportunities there and you talk about that on your website and they talk about that on their website and you get kind of those content links back and forth reciprocal linking is not bad as long as it's not a hundred percent of your linking structure or your linking opportunity right so um creating those community partnerships where you write about each other and kind of break up you know, your partners in the community. I really like that tactic. I think that that can be very lucrative. And yeah, it's not like a, you know, 50 DA website linking to you, but it's right next door. It's like hyper local link, really, really great opportunity for you. Or maybe it's um, uh, the theater downtown and they're partnering with the hotel up the road and putting packages together or something like that, um, that they write about each other and create, maybe they create each other's content in those cases. I'll write the content for you, what your website, you write the content for my website, we'll post it and link to each other kind of thing. I think there's a lot of opportunity around that. And it's, I think it's actually a lot easier than doing like cold outreach stuff, which is, unless you're, you know, um, Dan and Andrew Shotland, and you're sending out tens of thousands of, um, you know, opportunities or queries or outreach and hoping to get some back in and you have a big budget to do that because that's a big budget task. Um, Then I really like those community partnerships. I like that community karma way better just for as a word of mouth for your business as a as a opportunity to grow um, your word and your brand in your local area. I think it works way better. What other tactics have you got around kind of creating that local brand? Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you might like, you know, kind of creating events uh, locally sure. that could draw people in, or maybe maybe something that is newsworthy either to local bloggers or to you know, establish mm-hmm. kind of local news outlets. What's your kind of approach, and you know, what do you think of the kind of the, the biggest ROI tactics there? Sure. So first and foremost, I would say if you are not a creative person and you're struggling to figure out what to do, paying for a couple hours of a local PR person's time just on a consultation basis can be highly lucrative for you. They have they know the people in the community that you need to talk to. And so I think that there's opportunity there. So that might be where I'd start first. But um, I think that um, you kind of have to find 
um, the passions, passion projects that meet together. So um, I, my friend Aaron has a client that um, it's, it's a company called Vehicle Vault. And they're basically a climate controlled garage for storing classic and very expensive cars. And um, Vehicle Vault partners with different charities like um, I think they've done Make-A-Wish and a couple other ones in their local area down in Denver. And they hold events within the Vehicle Vault. So um, they rope off the car so you can look at them, but you can't get near them. And they offer their space for these fundraising events. And they get the news stations in there. And they partner with local caterers. And so, so events like that are a really great opportunity to get the word out. Um, if you have a passion project um, to, uh, you know, maybe you're really passionate about spaying and neutering pets or sponsoring little, maybe you're, kids are in little league and you're a coach or something like that, whatever your passion projects are. I think any way you can use that to build your brand is beneficial to the business because it's something a, the business owner or the people who work in the business care about, right? So it's more likely to get done because let's be honest, if people don't care about things, they don't do them. Um, so I think, you know, building those relationships in the community where you could hold events or maybe you just volunteer your space as a drop off for a charity. Um, there's a little store in town. It's a gift shop. And she has a bin out front where people can drop off um, pet food donations for the animal shelter. She's got a link from the animal shelter website. And all she did was let them put a bin in the front of her, you know, her store. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity um, if you get creative and, and maybe that's talking to a PR person, maybe it's talking to somebody like me who creates a lot of content and, and, um, you know, uh, kind of gets that, how you can be involved in your community in different ways. Um, but yeah, I like partnerships. I think partnerships work well because not all the weight falls on your own shoulders. Um, maybe you can, you can, you know, get together, a a couple of, uh, a caterer, a gift shop, an event space, and um, a DJ maybe, and be like, oh, you know, we're, we, I know all these people. What if I brought all of us together and we did a charity event for whatever it happens to be, Black Lives Matter, Lives Matter or something like that. And um, we'll get press from it. We'll link to each other from it. People in the community will come, they'll donate, they'll talk about it. Um, you know, those are all the opportunities. And I think the biggest opportunity you can get for building your brand is get reviews. The more you ask for reviews and the bigger your review profile is, the more people are going to talk about you. I think that those two things go hand in hand. If you're building a brand in your community, reviews, your reviews have to be stellar and you have to have, you know, a, a certain volume of them. Two isn't going to do it. 20 might start you down the road kind of thing. Absolutely. And I would say respond to reviews and interact with people leaving your reviews uh, yep. is, uh, is, a, is a kind of critical part of that. OK, brilliant, mm -hmm. Gary. Uh, let's go to uh, the next question. Uh, mm -hmm. This one comes from Jim. Jim says, we have two restaurants. Uh, they operate the same address, although they're different concepts, fine dining mm -hmm. and quick serve. Uh, at one point, okay. Google, Google merged the listings. We were able to separate them, but uh, one of the restaurants won't show up in the query, uh, either, in the, uh, either in the knowledge panel uh, or in maps. Uh, so this isn't really a content question, actually, more, much more kind of GMB related. Now, how do we get Google to, not as it says, recognize the business, mm -hmm. or do you think, how do we get Google to actually return both those businesses sure. for relevant queries? Sure. So I just put a link in the, in the chat box. Um, your, the second location is getting filtered because you're sharing an address and the pins are in very close proximity to each other. Um, I would make sure that your primary categories in Google My Business are different, um, not both restaurants. I would make one, you know, fast food or maybe takeout or catering maybe. And one, I think there's a fine dining category. So I'd make sure your categories are not the same. If you can get different phone numbers for the two locations, that can help you as well. Um, but because they're the kind of the same category and they're in very close proximity to each other, they're probably one of them is getting filtered out. And so um, I would I would read the article I popped in there and try and do as much as you can to make them look like two separate business. Yeah, and I would probably go as far to mention you know maybe update your primary citations so that your kind of core categories 
on those primary citations and match the new yep. category you use in, yep. in GMB uh, as well, just to reinforce the fact that it's absolutely a, a separate type of business. Uh, to the For ones. sure. But, um, yeah, that, that article on Sterling's guys is, uh, is really kind of good. Uh, tells you all you need to uh, need to know that. So uh, good luck with that particular challenge. Um, let us know how you get on. Um, okay, this next question comes from, um, from Tonya. Uh, excellent question, Tonya. Um, pretty big answer for you coming away from Carrie. How similar <laughs> can content be before, uh, before Google considers it to be duplicate content? So <laughs> I kind of give the tongue in cheek answer of 30%. There's no data or research <laughs> behind that number, but um, I get that some content is duplicate across pages. And don't forget your gutters count. So if you've got the same sidebar, the same footer, the same navigation on every page, when we're looking at the content on the page, that counts. So um, I would make sure that 30% of your content is, or sorry, 70% is unique. Don't duplicate any more than 30%. That, do you, I, yeah. Do you really look at the header and the footer? Because I mean, that's pretty often consistent across every page on a site. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's so important for the body text to be very unique. Um, I think it counts. I don't have any research that supports that. Um, I don't, you know, there's no penalty in duplicate content. Google just doesn't like it. <laughs> um, and so um, when you do a test, like I use the Sightliner tool to look for duplicate content and it will highlight the, all the gutters and the sidebars and everything is duplicate across pages. And um, it's a very good visual. Um, it gives it different colors if it's duplicate across multiple pages. So um, I think that you know, it's really important if you have a lot of content in your gutters and that they are, that the main body content is as unique as you can get it. I don't like pages that have like a boilerplate at the bottom of them that's like, we're the best in this location. Here's how you get a hold of us. Here's how, um, here's our form. And it's the same on every single page you know what, your value proposition for this thing is very different from your value proposition for this thing. In most cases, change it up. Don't be lazy. Um, you know, don't just copy paste from page to page and then change the first two paragraphs and think you're going to be, hmm. if you want to rank well, you have to put the work in. That's the key to, to it. You have to put the time in. You can't just boilerplate things. Now, if you're a national brand like Home Depot, you can do whatever the hell you want because you've got links galore. And, and you know, if the content was duplicate across a thousand pages, I don't think, I think Google would still rank them well. But you're not. You're probably a mom and pop with a couple of locations and you've got to, you know, rally against the giants. Yeah, it's interesting that the, the playing field is, not level and almost that duplication aspect is kind of obliterated by the sheer scale of a Home Depot uh, and all the authority that they've been able to amass through, you know, you know, epic backlink kind of acquisition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, but Tony, I hope that was useful. Let's go to uh, the next question. Uh, guys, sure. please keep up, please keep upvoting uh, questions. Uh, okay. Next question comes from uh, Chris. Chris says, uh, would you consider a blog valuable for, um, a local service area business uh, it seems to be mostly generic lifestyle type posts uh, that no one wants to read, but maybe Google cares about it. So <laughs> I am not a fan of blogging just to have content on your website. Um, I tell clients all the time, if you are writing content that is designed to sell your product or service, it should not go in your blog. It should be a page on your website. Blogs are for timely content that expires, like news, like an award you received, or um, a charity event that you attended or sponsored or something like that. That's what the blog is for. Pages on your website are evergreen and they're timeless. So blogs are timely, pages are timeless. Now, that being said, I have seen blogs draw traffic um, because the 
content is very specific, like 10 steps to X, Y, Z. Um, and in my opinion, that actually should be a page on the website, not a blog post. I think if, if you have content that is um, drawing a lot of traffic in for, to your blog um, and for a long period of time, it's obviously evergreen content. It's good for a, a long period of time, you should probably make it a page on your website, redirect it and keep it updated. Because as, as you write more blog content, it just gets pushed deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the no man's land that is, you know, slash category, slash archive, slash page, slash 75, right? So if it's really important to you, it should be a page on your website, not a blog post. That being said, blog can have its a blog can have its reason for being there, um, but I think too much attention is paid to writing blog posts and not enough attention is paid to writing and optimizing and conversion optimizing pages on the website. Okay, deeper question around that. <clears throat> Which types of pages, let's say you know, you've got location pages, um, you might have service focused pages, uh, blog posts, resources, which ones, which are the kind of money pages, which ones get the visibility inserts and lead to the most conversions? The ones that you've optimized for conversion. How many blog right. posts right. have you looked at? How many blog posts have you looked at where there's not even contact information in the blog? There's no form in the sidebar or call to action that says, hey, if you want us to help you, click here. You know, there's no buttons. Like, I think that the most successful blog posts are the ones that are optimized for conversion. If you just write a page of content, stick it in the blog, and you've not you've not optimized your blog template to actually convert people, why are you putting content there? Um, nine times out of 10, that's the problem I find. People don't even have a, a link to the contact above the fold in the blog or a form that you could fill out to get a hold of people. Um, I think that's a big failure of blogs. Do you think it's better to try and convert someone directly from a blog post? Or is it better to try and get them into, you described funnels earlier, uh -huh. essentially to try and qualify them more before they, they convert? I think it really depends. Um, if you're writing good blog content, then they're probably already qualified when they get there because they came from a long tail search term. And, um, you know, converting them from the blog is probably just fine for you. Um, if you're writing blog content about, um, let's say you're a plumber and you've written, I used to have this plumber client who would put like recipes and stuff up in their blog. <laughs> and I'm like, this is totally irrelevant to like, especially recipes, because that's like a one and done. Your bounce rate is inflated because you have recipes in your blog. Stop doing that. Um, but, you know, I, I think that if the content is very relevant to what you do, then having them um, set, having them convert from the blog post is great because like I said, most blog traffic, most blog traffic is long tail keyword terms that are very qualified to something you do if you've crafted the content in your blog correctly. Do you see from across your kind of client base in terms of the, where, where, the, where, the in, where the traffic lands, are you able mm -hmm. to give any kind of rough estimate on how much traffic goes in at like a, obviously homepage I'm presuming is like number one, but let's yeah. say location pages versus content like blogs FAQs, mm -hmm. resources. Can you give us a sort of a sense of the, the volume that goes to those kind of core product service pages versus other, other types of pages? Yeah. So my gut tells me that um, location pages would be number two, service pages number three, and then blog pages. But there's always those weird cases where you run into this specific, like we have a client that's a dentist and um, for whatever reason, um, they have a page of content on their website about tooth pain causing sore throats. And they get an insane amount of traffic from sore throat queries, like, like more than their homepage. It's just a weird thing. And um, so there's like this one off where you get something that really does really well from your blog. And um, in those cases, like a lot of the content that came in from those queries was not relevant to somebody wanting a dentist 
Um, so, you know, do you convert a lot of traffic off of that? No. Um, that's why I'm really a big fan of your blog content being very focused on your brand, your location, and or your service so that that traffic is qualified. But yeah, I would, that would kind of be homepage, location, services, and then blog pages would be my gut there. I don't have any research. I haven't really looked that deep into that yeah. to create that hierarchy. So, so just to kind of clarify, in terms of the blog content, and second day ago, you said uh, if you're writing a, um, a, a bit of content that's about your service or your brand, make it a page on the site, not in the blog. But then a second ago, you said mm -hmm. if you are going to create blog posts, hook it back into the brand and the location as well. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you saying that actually you've still got to, to kind of think of the localization and, and tying the blog post back into the brand and the location to some degree? Yeah. I mean, that's the, op why would you write a blog post and not, and not talk about who you are and what you do and where you do it? Um, you know, now you're just creating junk content. Like you're the object of every piece of content you pull on, put on your website is to sell somebody something, whether it's a service or a product or, you know, whatever, even if it's, if it's subtle, like really you're talking about um, this event that you participated in, um, you know, you're, you're still trying to sell some, some somebody something. <laughs> That's still the goal, right? <laughs> the ultimate goal. Now you don't want to be like used car salesman sell somebody something on a on a um, community karma type post, but that's still the ultimate goal. So you still want to make sure that you, um, you know, get those pieces in there. I still think it's important. Okay, Carrie, we're going to probably going to overrun by ten minutes. Are you all right to hang on? That's okay, yeah, minutes? that's yeah. fine. Okay. I don't Great. have a problem with that. Yeah. With that client, that one that has one blog post that gets more traffic than its homepage, is that like mm -hmm. nationwide traffic, not localized? Yeah, and why it's not it, localized. Why, why did it do so well? I mean, it's presumably up against some really big, high authority sites that should have similar content and rank better. What do you think is, is, is working for it? Um, my suspicion is that she has a featured snippet in some way, shape or form, which I've seen before. So, or a people always ask, people also ask drop down links to that content on her website. I've seen that before. Like um, mm -hmm. I had a plumber client in Virginia and um, if you did queries around plumbing, you'd get the people also ask box. And the first result, if you dropped it down, was from a plumber in San Diego. Um, for whatever reason, Google liked that piece of content and um, promoted it into that people also ask box. And it got tons, I'm sure he got tons of unqualified traffic from all over. Because if you're if I'd set my location to Virginia, I'd see it. If I set my location to Denver, I'd see it. If I set my location to local to him, I'd see it. So I think that I think that's what happened there. I think she had some sort of a featured snippet. People also ask box thing that would just pull that content in. I think it's since died down a bit. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't looked at it lately, but um, yeah, for a while it was terrible. <laughs> yeah. Do you think it's there? For, I mean, given the maybe the the kind of broad geographic sort of nature of getting into um sort of snippets and also ask boxes mm -hmm. is that is that a really a valuable strategy for smbs or a valuable objective it's not really going to convert that much i don't think we can say that yet i don't uh, i haven't seen enough research or had enough research opportunity in my work to decide if it's worth it or not worth it um i think that one of the problems with featured snippets in organic right now is that they're not localized in many cases. And a lot of the traffic to the client, like maybe the information is relevant nationally, but the traffic for my client is not relevant at all. Like in the case of the sore throat thing. Um, I think that the more featured snippets that are showing that are localized, like um, I saw an example yesterday where they're now pulling hours and the more hours opportunities into the SERP for branded search. So like if I search Whole Foods Basalt, which is our lo local Whole Foods, it's an hour away from my house, um, then I get senior hours pulled right into the SERP. I get, you know, their store hours versus their senior hours. Like that's a valuable featured snippet from a local perspective. Um, you know, the featured snippet with um, that's generic for Whole Foods, probably not valuable locally. Um, 
but um, I think that there's different featured snippet opportunities and some are better for us than others, but I'm a big fan. If you can mark it up, I'm a pretty big fan of marking it up. <laughs> That's kind of... I guess, I guess it's not, it's not going to be harmful, is it? But it's just right. Not, no, uh, as long as you do it right, don't don't fake it. Don't mark it up wrong. Don't you know use the wrong type of markup for whatever you're marking up to manipulate. You know, do it the right way. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you. Going to go on to uh, the next question. It comes from uh, uh, Pratik. Uh, now this has actually got uh, two parts to it, so I'm going to try and knit these together. Uh, this okay. was an interesting question around chartered accountants. Who Pratik says. Sorry, my page has jumped. Um, but uh, charged accountants uh, aren't allowed to create a uh, Facebook or Twitter account because of some of their institutional laws. I can't vouch that. Mm -hmm. I'm not, uh, I don't know. Um, so they therefore can't market themselves. Um, you know, how can services like this make the best use of SEO to showcase their presence to prospective clients? So um, you can't have social. I would get that content on your own website. Um, that's all about making sure that your value proposition is in everything on page. And if you have off page opportunities, getting it there as well. So look at your brand search. What can you control on that search result? Um, you know, can you update the description at this listing that and include your value proposition? Um, you know, I know in a lot of cases you can't say you're the best or um, those types of restrictions. I'm not too familiar with this kind of a situation, but I think that if you can't go out and do social, then you got to do it on your own website and toot your own horn a little bit. You know, if you can't say we're the best such and such, um, you can say um, rated five stars at because that's a, that's a fact statement. You are rated five stars at at this particular place. So that's kind of what I um, what I'd focus on is getting that value proposition in as many pieces of content where it's legal for you to put it. <laughs> okay, um, question okay, from Tonya. Do you, do you have a tool for doing gap analysis in? I think you mentioned Ahrefs. Are there yeah. any other ones that are yeah. really sort of custom built uh, for that? I think SEMrush has a gap analysis as well. I find I really like the Ahrefs one because you can negative keywords. So like if you're trying to refine the list, like sometimes brands will come up in that gap analysis. So you can put exclude keywords that have these in there. And so it's really easy to put the negatives in so that you can refine your list before you export it. So I really like the Ahrefs tool. I prefer that one. But those are the two I know of that do it. Okay. Uh, this question is a bit of a, a, uh, a sort of repeat of some stuff we covered, but I thought I'd ask it anyway, because uh, someone outvoted it. It comes from Craig. Mm -hmm. It says, question for Carrie, for a brick and mortar CPA firm located mm -hmm. outside of a major city, we want to rank in the major city. Um, he basically says, you know, how effective is creating city pages? Is that, I'm like rephrasing and we've covered that, is creating city pages the right way to go for the major city and its suburbs? Yes. Yeah. And I would look at the what suburbs or what parts of the city you want to rank in. Like, um, you know, for a landscaper, you're going to pick the most lucrative neighborhoods with the best lawns, the most money where people want to you know, where people want to spend. So, you know, figure out your hierarchy of tar targeting, like what priority do these different suburbs and neighborhoods have for you? Um, is it very industrial? Are you a business tax accountant? Then that's where you want to target. Um, is it very um, rural and you don't do farm taxes? Don't target that one. So, you know what I mean? Like, I think that's, that city pages are the way to do it. Look, you know, that those pages, like I said, getting in the three pack and local search is going to be really difficult depending upon market and competition. So, you know, getting those organic rankings is going to be really important for you and that you do that with city pages. Okay, great. Uh, next question comes from Ben. Uh, oh, um, uh, let, let me add really quick. Sorry, Jason just had a really good point. And make sure that you're putting those regional colloquialisms in those city pages. So if there's a neighborhood that has a like a regional nickname or a colloquialism, then use those in your content because a lot of people like in Boston, um, South Boston is called Southie. So you're going to want to make sure that you're optimizing for the words that the people, the locals oh, mean, use yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good, uh, good point on that front. Um, this question comes from Ben. Uh, it says, it's very kind of schema. It says, um, you know, can you add markup for FAQs 
uh, and let's say kind of organizations and local businesses to the same page? So FA, yeah, you can nest your schema. Um, it should be nested. Um, you should test it and make sure it validates. If you're doing this at scale, I would recommend using uh, Martha Van Berkel's schema app tool because um, it automatically does the nesting for you. It can get picky and messy when you're trying to put multiple types of schema on a page. Um, you know, sometimes like WordPress will strip out things that you need there to validate and it gets kind of messy. So um, you can put multiple types of markup on the same page though, yes. Um, and on that point, actually, um, Carrie just mentioned Martha Van Berkel. Uh, on the 8th of July, uh, Martha is joining us for a local search clinic to discuss oh, everything nice. related to schema. So two weeks from now, Martha will be here discussing everything. Save your about schema, schema questions for her because she w- knows way more than I do. <laughs> she, she, she knows way more than I do. She makes me feel incredibly stupid every time I speak <laughs> to her. Uh, so, uh, yeah, do come along. Uh, 8th of July, uh, Martha will be here to answer uh, all your questions. Um, okay, so going down, uh, this kind of question comes from uh, Impact Tech Systems. Uh, I'm assuming that's not his, his actual name, but maybe his company. Um, it says, what should you do if you have 50 different product models on individual pages with the same content about the general product benefits, you know, white pages, financing calls to action? Is it bad to duplicate this content on each page? Um, you know, uh, what, you know what, and how would you tackle that? Um, what percentage of that content is, is is that content of the total content on your page? If it's, you know, half your page, three quarters of your page, then it's bad. Um, I would make sure that um, either you beef up the unique content on that page or you rewrite your boilerplate on each page. Um, I, I don't think you're going to be very successful if that's a, a large part of the content on each page. I think it okay. needs to be unique, unless you're Amazon. Yeah, I guess if you've <laughs> got if you've got kind of generic white pages and financing call to actions, then they should probably just link off to another another dedicated mm-hmm. page on the side that all those pages yeah. kind of link to. Yep, make one page with that stuff, link off to it, and put your um, value proposition for that product or service on that page instead. Yeah. Why should you buy this thing from us? This thing, this product model from us instead of from our competitor. What do we offer you for this specific thing? Yeah. That's what I do yeah. too. That's a good That's idea. Good. Um, okay, uh, let's have, uh, this is kind of one more question. Um, okay. Uh, this one goes from Jeff. We receive a weekly article from a trade association uh, that is meant to be published by its members. If we post this article on our blog without major changes, will Google look at that as duplicate content and does that create any issues? So they send it out. It's meant to be published by the members, but multiple people get it. Like they, like their list is a thousand people and a thousand people get this article and a thousand people republish that. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. You're not, it's no benefit to you at all. I would rewrite it. Um, If you get it specifically and they don't send it to anybody else and they don't publish it themselves, then that's the content. But um, you know, then you're playing the game of who publishes it first. And does Google recognize the correct first publisher? Um, I would not bother with that content. I would rewrite it. Um, You know, even just going in and changing, you know, like I said, if you can change 70% of the content, and actually it's a lot easier than people think it is, rearrange some sentences, rewrite, you know, use your thesaurus, (laughs) you know, change out some words in there and stuff. Um, I would, I think there would be benefit to that. If it's content that will help you sell your product or service, add yeah. your location information into that content. Cause I'm sure it's different. It's not stated in there. So why, why are we the best X, Y, Z in PDQ? This is why, or, you know, those, that type of content, but yeah, if, if multiple people are republishing it, there's not a lot of value there. Okay. Apologies, there are actually some more questions that I, I thought I'd scroll to the bottom, but I haven't kind of got there yet. So uh, we'll tackle these anyway. Uh, this one comes okay. from Ryan. It says, in terms of content and social media, is the goal to have your website mm-hmm. as the main hub where your content lives and then use social mm-hmm. to attract people to the website? Or there are times where different content should sit on social and GMB. You know, how do you kind of manage the need to publish unique content in all these places? And how do you see mm-hmm. them working as a, as a content ecosystem? 
So I think it used to be that our goal was to get all of our social media content to drive people to the website, but we can convert people in multiple ways now on multiple platforms like Facebook. You can get people to message you directly right there. That's a lead opportunity. Um, you know, Instagram, you can buy products right off of a swipe up on Instagram stories and, and, you know, purchase something right there. So I think that there's less of that nowadays, but, um, you know, if the best place for them to convert is on your website, then you have to think of, you know, crafting your message to get them to your website. And I think that um, it's a fallacy that every piece of content you put on social media needs to be 100% unique. Like what I do this all the time, I copy and paste my Twitter post over to Facebook, and I just change how I tag people or businesses in it, because a Twitter tag won't work in a Facebook. But there's no reason that needs to be two different pieces of content. It's not going to rank anywhere. I'm not worried about Google seeing duplicate content across Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. That's not a worry for me. Now, if there's this particular action you want somebody to take on Facebook, then yeah, you change that content and say, leave us a message below or, you know, click the button and, um, um, send us, you know, a form or whatever happens to be your, preferred thing to have happen on Facebook, um, then, then you change your message that way. But, um, uh, and then, so I think that even the smallest business could benefit from having a content or an editorial calendar, because if you plan out what you're going to, what topic you're going to cover and where it's going to publish and where you're going to share it and you have your everything kind of planned out, it makes it so much easier for your employees and your team to understand this is what I'm doing. This is where I need to put it. And it's not like, oh, yeah, I should put that on Twitter. or Oh, yeah, I should put this over here. It's planned out. So I, I highly recommend a content calendar, even if you're only writing content once a quarter. It could be so helpful to at least have a plan in place for this is this is you know we do this at sterling sky we write a piece of content it goes on my spreadsheet it gets shared out to here here and here and then i mark that task is done you know just so i so that you have a checklist of getting that content um created and what topics are you going to cover and and if new topics come in or there's a newsworthy thing that comes in how do we insert that into our content calendar should we demote something to promote that you know having that fluid um, opportunity and calendar to, to help you plan, I think is so important for content creation. Yeah, I would thoroughly agree with that. And I'm sure our content team, uh, Jamie and Steph would also agree. Um, kind of related kind of question here about kind of GMB posts. This question actually comes from mm -hmm. Path. He says, you know, how often, you know, should I be doing a GMB post? So maybe to mm -hmm. elaborate on that question, you know, you know, do you, if you could just, you know, redistribute your content onto one platform, mm -hmm. you know, be it Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, kind of GMB, you know, what's your kind of hierarchy there? And do you, do you have a kind of rule of thumb around using GMB posts, frequency approach? So, um, as far as the reper or the hierarchy, I think it really depends on what you're selling and where you're selling it and what kind of an audience you have on those platforms. If I'm a personal injury lawyer, Twitter's probably not my platform. <laughs> In fact, if I'm a personal injury lawyer, I'm probably going to spend most of my time on Google posts. And I'll tell you why in a second. Um, so I really think it depends upon what platform is beneficial to you. My husband is a painter. He's a painting contractor. He owns his own painting business. His most beneficial platform is actually our local Facebook group. It's got like 30,000 members. And there's always somebody posts in there somebody paint my house. I need somebody to paint my living room I need an interior painter and Todd doesn't go on there and say hey I'm a painter Todd waits and his tribe of raving fans post hey you need to call Todd here's his phone number and then Todd goes and chimes in yeah I'm happy to give you a free estimate he's not actively promoting himself there but that's his best you know source of non general contractor jobs is that Facebook group. So I really think the hierarchy of where you should be concentrating really depends upon your niche and your market, like what's popular there. So the second half of that question was GMB posts and should you be doing them? I think you should be doing them for a few reasons. First of all, 
the content from a GMB post that's related to a query gets pulled over into your local search results. Um, I believe in the map pack for sure in the local finder, you get a little snippet that comes over with a little icon next to it that says this person, sometimes it'll say this person's website mentions or um, it'll pull a snippet out of that Google post. So I think posts are really important. As far as frequency, at least every seven days, if you don't have the bandwidth to do that, then use an event post because you can put an expiration date on it that's longer than seven days. But every seven days, your posts disappear, unless it's a COVID-19 post, which is still promoted, I believe. Um, and I believe those are supposed to be 14 days, although we've seen them last longer. So um, yeah, I, I think posts are worthwhile just from a Google sourcing those for not only those snippets, but also if you start if you start typing a question in the ask a question box, it'll source posts for answers as well as reviews and um, other Q and A. So um, I I do think GMB posts are important. I think you should vary the topic. Um, if you don't, like I said, if you don't have the bandwidth to post that frequently, at least use an event post so you have something up there. Very worth clarifying for everyone that the GMB posts essentially get taken down after seven days. So, and those snippets only get pulled from live posts. So mm -hmm. to keep benefiting from that opportunity, you need to kind of keep posting. With the events post then, so do you essentially utilize that for more evergreen content, even when yeah. it's not really an event? Yeah, um, that's how it's been used. So um, it, it'd be like need, like maybe the title would be, um, you know, need to hire a personal injury lawyer and you put a start and expiration date on there and it'll stay live on your um, business listing until the expiration date, but it's more generic content. And it's, I don't highly recommend it, but if you just don't have the bandwidth to put something up every seven days, then you either do that or you get a tool that lets you schedule GMB posts. And there's a couple out there um, that sort of work. Yeah, kind of. okay. <laughs> um, interesting, as a, as a nice gray hat tactic you've shared with us there, uh, Carrie. Um, brilliant guys, you've run over run uh, by a long time. I think we've covered up all of the kind of questions in part as you've kind of gone through. Um, thank you everyone uh, for, for kind of participating, for giving us your questions. Uh, the chat has been, uh, has been going ballistic. Thank you for everyone for, uh, <laughs> for kind of pitching in there and sharing things and uh, just generally being a fantastic local search community. Um, I love running these clinics. A, I get to talk to amazing people like Carrie uh, who get to impress me and you know, uh, kind of educate me at the, at the same time. Uh, but also just love seeing the kind of support um, the interaction, uh, often the kind of humor that kind of comes across in the chat, quite distracting, um, <laughs> but I do, I do really, really love it. So, uh, Carrie, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for giving us uh, your kind of time today. I do appreciate it.